The add submodule here of my RISC-V ALU had a number of problems with it. But the main issue I had was it's very difficult to test. Currently, I'm not driving the pins down the bottom, and if I touch these with my finger, then they float back and forth between 0 and 1 as inputs and produce somewhat random output. So I'm going to develop a test module that I can plug this into, and then I'll be able to drive those A and B inputs, set whether I'm subtracting or not, and read the result out. So I'll create another board here in KiCad. And the first thing that I'll do is add a PCI Express card edge connector. The card edge has three main buses that are 32 bits each, and the other control lines that I'll want to write to and read from for testing. I've created a custom symbol in KiCad for the card edge, which I can look at with the KiCad symbol editor. If I search for ellipsis, then I can see the custom symbols that I've created, and it's the 164 pin bus here that I'm interested in. If I open that up, we can see that there are multiple units. Each bus is within its own unit and each control is within its own unit. For example, the ALU control bits that will eventually tell the ALU which operation to perform. Unit B has some general purpose pins, whose purpose will vary for connections between different boards. Unit C has some status bits, which will tell us important information about the ALU result. Unit D has the 32 bits of port A, which will be used for one of the ALU inputs. Unit E has the 32 bits of port B, and therefore the other ALU input. Unit F is for port C, and that will have the result from the ALU. And finally, unit G has all of the power connections. So it's important that I have plenty of power and plenty of ground for the return path from each module. So I have either a ground or a power line for every eight bits. So all of these will need to be connected up. KiCad already has a footprint for the card edge connector, which we can see in the footprint editor. My custom PCI Express symbol can use this for the card edge, but I've had to make my own footprint for the socket. The socket footprint here is pretty similar to the card edge. It just doesn't have the slot, and it's designed so that it's easy to put the card edge up against it and solder it in. Making custom symbols and footprints is pretty easy in KiCad, and definitely something worth learning how to do. I can add the custom symbol in the same way I add any other component by pressing A and then searching for my component. You can see that if I expand the custom component here, it has units A through to G as we saw. I can add each of these individually, but if I just select the root level here and click OK, then it will allow me to add them one by one and I'll add each unit. And each of those units will be connected based on their name. If I zoom in here, we can see that this is the uh, bus ellipsis 164J1A. So J1A here represents the symbol number. So it's symbol number one and it's unit A. So over here, I have symbol one and unit D. And because these are all J1, they're all connected. So when I go to the PCB designer, all of these units will be combined together into the card edge or the socket. So these three units here are the 32-bit buses, the two inputs to the ALU and the output from the ALU. To control the I.O. through the PCI Express connector, I'll use an Arduino Uno. The Uno has a symbol that's already in KiCad, so I'll add that now as well. The Arduino Uno is based on the ATmega328, which is the microcontroller chip in the middle here. And that has three ports exposed. It has the port on these six pins down here, which in Arduino terms is A. A for analog, although these can be used for either digital input or output as well as analog input. We also have port D down here, which has pin 0 through to 7, although pin 0 and 1 can't really be used. They're used for serial communication over USB, so they connect to this chip here and then through to the USB for programming. So if I want to be able to reprogram the Arduino, I won't be able to use pin 0 and 1 down here, and that leaves us with six pins on port D. The ATmega also has port B, which is an 8-bit digital port. However, on the Arduino, we have pins 8 through to 13 here, uh, which in Arduino terms is also D, so this is D8 to 13. So we only have six of those port B pins exposed. So I have six pins here, six here, and then six down here. So that gives us a total of 18 inputs and outputs. However, we need 32 bits for each of our A and B output ports and another 32 bits for the C input port. We also need outputs for control lines and for the general purpose I.O. So altogether, it's about 138 I.O. pins, which is much more than what we can get from the Arduino. 
So to extend the Arduino's I.O., I could use shift registers. For example, I could use the 748C164, and this allows for serial input from the Arduino, which will produce an 8-bit parallel output. And we can see that here. We have a clock input. We also have an asynchronous clear input, which uh, I probably won't need to use. And then we have our A and B serial inputs here. Now, one of these can be used as a, an enable signal, and the other one can be used as a serial input. So just think of this as a single serial input line, and that would come from the Arduino. So we have a clock line and a serial input. We drive those from the Arduino, and we push our bits through each of these flip-flops. The output of the first flip-flop is connected to the input of the second, and so every clock pulse, the bit that was here, will push through to the next, and so on. So our bits push through down the line. And after eight clock cycles, we'll have all of these populated with our data, and we can read the output from this parallel output here. So that allows us to take a single serial input and convert it to an 8-bit output, so long as we have a clock signal. We could also chain this QH through to another module, so that could go through to the serial input of the next module. And we can therefore, with just two pins from the Arduino for a clock and a serial input, we can drive as many parallel outputs as we like. So that solves the problems of expanding our output, uh, but I still need to expand the inputs as well. So I could use a 748C165, which can load parallel inputs and then deliver serial data back to the Arduino. So it has a shift or load option here. Note the bar above low, that means that load is active low and shift is active high. If we have a low signal on our load input here, it gets inverted and essentially activates all of these NAND gates. Now they are NAND gates, but note that they are doubly inverted. So the inputs to our flip-flops here are also inverted. So we can just see this as an AND gate that is activated on a low signal here. When all of these AND gates are activated, our parallel inputs, A through H here, are loaded down into the shift registers all in one go. We can then set our shift back to a one that disables all of these and then the signal instead will come from our serial input here. Note that that's an asynchronous load. We have S and we have R, so that's set and reset, and that's happening asynchronously. But then we have a D input here for our serial input. And so we can shift a bit in, and we can also shift bits out. So we can do a parallel load and then drive the clock to shift the bits through in the same way that we did before, and we can catch those bits out the ends and pass them on to the Arduino. So that allows us to take a whole range of parallel inputs and shift them out. And we can chain these again. So our serial input here and our serial output could be chained together. So this doesn't have to just be eight bits. We can combine chips to get as many bits as we like. So that allows me to either expand the input or expand the output, but I want to be able to expand either the input or the output depending on what module I'm testing. So I need something that's a little bit more universal. And that's what the bidirectional universal shift register gives me. It has the D inputs down the left-hand side here, which is for a parallel load. It has our Q outputs, so we have full access to the parallel data within the chip. We also have a serial input coming through here. And then we have a somewhat more complex logic than what we've seen before, but essentially these AND gates are just acting as switches. We can either take the serial input here and feed that into our flip-flop, or we can take our parallel input here and load that through this AND gate into the flip-flop, or we can take the output from the next chip here. So you can see we take our Q output here and that can be fed back around and into the D flip-flop. So this allows us to be uh, sorry, to, this allows us to be bidirectional, so we can either shift in from the left or shift in from the right, and it allows us to have a parallel load. So this gives us the full complexity of both of those other chips. But there's still one problem. The D and Q pins are separate, and I need them to be the same. I need to be able to say one pin on my board is an input or that pin is an output. So I need some way to be able to combine these two. And I can either add extra circuitry, perhaps a buffer or similar to do that, or I can use a chip that does all of that for me. The MCP23017 is an IO expander chip that I can communicate with over I2C, and that's just a serial interface. 
a little more complex than the serial input to our shift register. It involves a clock and a single serial input, but it allows you to connect to multiple devices based on an address. So I can connect a whole bunch of these to the I2C bus. I2C is supported by most microcontrollers, including the ATmega328P on the Arduino Uno. And if we look at the functional block diagram, we can see in the middle here, this serializer, deserializer, and control logic. This is essentially a bidirectional universal shift register or something similar anyway. And it's connected to an I squared C driver here via a serial input of some sort. And then the parallel outputs come through here to our GPIO. And in this case, we have 16 parallel outputs uh, or rather parallel IO. So these could be inputs or outputs and we're either loading them from our shift register type logic here, or we're loading it into the shift register logic. And the advantage this has over the universal shift register that we saw before is this bidirectional behavior is all driven on the same pins. We don't have separate Q outputs and D inputs. They're all in the same place and we can select whether they are inputs or outputs. So this is exactly what we want. Now there's a address line here. So A2 to A0, a three bit address. And that address is decoded to activate the I2C chip. And so I can specify what address the chip has. With three bits, that means I can have eight unique addresses and therefore I can use eight of these chips with a single I2C bus. And that's only two wires. So I've got a serial clock and serial data for I2C and I can connect eight of these chips onto those same two wires. So I've only taken up two pins of the Arduino and I'll get eight times 16 IO. The Arduino will send the address serially over this SDA line and that address will then be compared with the address on the specific chip and decide if the message is for, the, is for that chip. It will then send data serially over this link and that data can then be serialized or deserialized in here. Now this still isn't quite enough for our 138 pins, but it gives us 128 IO pins using only two of the Arduino's pins. And what's left can then come directly from the remaining Arduino IO. So let's add eight of these MCP23017 chips. And we can see that there are four versions. What I'm going to be using is the SO package. So I'll select this one and then create eight of them. Right, so I've got all of the pieces here. It's a complete and utter mess. So what I'll do is I'll rearrange this using some hierarchical sheets, get it all organized, get it all wired up, and then I can start developing the PCB. I've rearranged things here to tidy up the layout. However, depending on the resolution of your screen and the sharpness of your eyes, you may be able to see some oddities in how I've assigned the IO to each chip. Logically, you'd think that just using two chips for each 32-bit bus would make sense, 16 bits for each chip. Uh, however, there's a problem with that. If we look at the data sheet for the MCP23017, the second feature it lists is that the ports are bidirectional. However, pin 7 on each port is output only for the I2C version of the chip. The package type further shows this. I'm using the one on the left here. This is the I2C version. Uh, which you can tell by the serial clock and serial data lines here. The one over here is the SPI version. We can see that pin 7 for port A and pin, where is it, pin 7 for port B are output only, uh, whereas the SPI has these as bidirectional. I want most of the I.O. to be bidirectional, especially for the 32-bit buses. Since I'll have eight chips, there'll be 16 bits that are output only across all of the chips. So I have to choose which 16 bits I don't need to test as an input to the Arduino. Back in KeyCAD, if I have a look at one of the card edge connections, I can see all the I.O. that the test card will be connecting to. Starting at the top left here, we have the power connection. That's nothing to do with the I.O., so that's fine. We have our 32-bit port A, port B, and port C. And these are the ports that will be used to take two values from a register file, which hopefully we'll look at in the next video, and then output the result from the ALU into port C, for example. And different parts of the CPU will use these in different ways. Ports A, B, and C are used to pass data between different modules within the CPU. So depending on what part of the CPU I'm testing, any of these pins might need to be input or output. Next, we have the status bits. 
These are generated by the ALU and then they're used by other parts of the CPU. So again, these need to be bidirectional to allow for all of these modules to be tested. The general pins have various purposes, so I'd like to keep my options open for those and keep those bidirectional as well. And that only leaves the control signals. There'll be a single module within the CPU that generates the control signals. And so for all except that module, the test card needs to be generating outputs from the Arduino to be providing the control signals to the other components. So I'll make these output only from the test card and we'll just have to find another way to test the control module itself when I get to that. That's a future problem. I don't need to deal with that now. Going back up to the root, you can see that I've interleaved the control signals among the other I.O. pins so that control is always connected to pin 7. And this is uh, the same across all of the I.O. expander chips. The other features worth noting on these chips is their reset and interrupt pins. The reset is connected directly to the Arduino I.O. For the interrupts, the MCP23017 has an option to all the interrupts together, meaning if either port A or port B of the chip generates an interrupt, both interrupt A and B will be triggered. So I can ignore one of the interrupts and just read the others. So that leaves eight interrupts, one for each chip. Even so, I was still running out of I.O. space on the Arduino, so I've paired up the interrupts with OR gates, leaving just four interrupts to detect. Finally, I've used the remaining Arduino I.O. for the status bits and the clock signals, giving us a total of 138 I.O., all controlled by the Arduino. Jumping over to the PCB editor, you can see that I've gone ahead and completed that design as well. So it's ready for me to get the PCB printed and order the components. I think this video has gone on long enough though, so I'll pick this up again once the PCB and the parts arrive.